Coming to you from beautiful Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, we're familiar with Spa Day for your plants. It was, well, made popular by all the people enjoying houseplants after winter, taking their houseplants out for a walk dusting them, basically giving their plants a, a little bit of uh, pampering. But why not have a spa day for your outdoor plants? I think it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, I think so too. Now, of course, as people, uh, you know, we have a spa day and I'm amazed at everything you can do. Uh, it, it's unreal. The hydrotherapy, jet bath, massage, pedicure or manicure, mud bath, Microderm abrasion, salt scrub clay, or herbal body mass. I like that cucumber on the eyes thing. You know, that looks really comforting to me. I've never done it. Oh, well, it's very simple and very refreshing. Yeah. You should try it, especially if this cucumber is very cold yeah. and your eyes are kind of, you know, hot and dry. I like it. I like it. Seaweed body wrap, aromatherapy, acupuncture, waxing, reflexology, massage, sauna, hot stone treatment, beer bath, hydrotherapy, steam room, oxygen, etc., etc. Unreal. And waxing when they tear the the hair off. That's a ripoff in my mind. Sorry, bad pun <laughs> right at the start. Now, when I think about uh, spa day for our outdoor plants, one of the first things that pops into my mind is Epsom salt. Oh, gosh, no. People love, I know that's why I'm bringing it up, <laughs> people love an Epsom salt bath. It's relaxing. Well, what about for your plants, uh, Stacy? online there's, you know, and these are the salts that are not for your French fries. Uh, Epsom comes from a, a place in England. I think it's south of London. Uh, they're mineral salts. And um, the argument is they add uh, magnesium, which is important for photosynthesis for your plants. You would balk at that. People use it on roses, tomatoes, and peppers. Why do you balk? Uh, okay. So I get that people like to, you know, have something that's like, we're pulling a fast one on the system. We're beating the man by using Epsom salts and not fertilizer. <laughs> like, I get that. You know, people like those kind of hacks. And it's true. The actual central molecule of chlorophyll is magnesium. Mm -hmm. And Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate or magnesium sulfide. I don't remember which, but yeah, so, magnesium any chemists sulfate. out there don't know. Okay. Um, but the simple fact is that the majority of residential landscapes and gardens are not deficient in magnesium. And so it does absolutely no good uh, and, and can actually do harm to apply this unless you know it's needed. And so because it's like this household thing and you know you know if you've soaked your feet or taken a bath in Epsom salts that it's it's good for you, they just think it's this harmless household thing that they can just you know put willy-nilly on their plants. But there's two potential issues. Well, first of all, there's three. The first one is that it's just a waste of money and resources if the plants don't need them and there's no benefit. Second of all, um, if it, it's salt, so you are salting your soil every time you apply magnesium or magnesium sulfate. Mm -hmm. And while it's true that salt is held very uh, uh, lightly to soil molecules and it can be uh, washed out very quickly just from rain or irrigation, you are still salt, literally salting your soil sure. when you apply up some salts. And third of all, if you are applying an abundance of magnesium, you can induce a deficiency in calcium. So all of the essential nutrients for plants in the soil, they work together and they have these relationships. So if something gets like way out of balance, it can actually tie up or make unavailable to the plant other nutrients um, due to various chemical reactions. So you're applying magnesium sulfate or, or Epsom salts and you're actually can, you know, repeated use because you think, oh, hey, this is this harmless household thing and I can just, I can't possibly harm my plants or do anything wrong by applying this you could actually induce a calcium deficiency in your garden. Let's leave the Epsom salts home for our spa day and move yeah. right Save along. Save them for yourself, fellow gardeners. <laughs> you might need them at the end of the day of gardening, but your plants almost certainly do not. How about hydrotherapy? Stir the mulch. I like to stir the mulch mm. in my landscape. Mulch can become hydrophobic. Yeah. And in summer, uh, to allow the mulch to breathe, I think that that's a spa approach for uh, your plants. Uh, a mud bath, maybe top dressing with a good organic material. Uh, we've talked in the past about dairy dew, but some kind of 
organic uh, matter that you could add to the soil. And I like a jet bath, okay? I don't know how you feel about this, Stacy, but take, for example, uh, dwarf Alberta spruce. Okay, if yes. If it's hot and dry outside, uh, the mites are going to like that. Oh, they are going to love it. And so I like to take a hose and blast some jet water right into the center of some of these dense plants, and you can almost hear them go, ah. <sighs> But you're not using the car washing nozzle, right? No, on your hose no car wash <laughs> nozzle. Uh-uh. Not Just giving it a that. little shower. <laughs> Spoil your soil. How about uh, slow-release uh, fertilizer? Don't forget to feed. Uh, the plants do need to be fed. And again... You know, when you pick out that fertilizer, you can get some fertilizers that are just quick release. Here today, gone tomorrow. But as you know, I like the prills that last mm -hmm. for three to uh, three to four months. So when you check the package of a product, a gardening product that you buy for your plants or your garden, I always like to look at it this way. And that is uh, with these packages, it's party on the front, business on the back. So flip That's the true. package over and read the back of the package and what's in that package because the front of the package is going to have cute kids kicking around a soccer ball in this beautiful yard and everything is great. Yeah, it's so important. Any uh, product that you're buying for your garden, whether it's a fertilizer, some sort of pesticide, what, you know, mycorrhizae, which we've also talked about, always read the back. It's so important because, you know, it's not just what's in it. It's also how you're going to apply it, when exactly. you're going to apply it. And there's so many things that like the timing is very crucial. And so you might be buying something only to come home, read the instructions and say, well, shoot, I can't apply this until next spring. Then it sits in your garage, goes bad, you forget about it. So, you know, it pays well, to do your reading. And Stacy, as a talented professional copywriter like you, um, you want people to read the directions. Oh, I definitely, yes. Right? I do want people to, yeah. because everyone wants them to be successful. You know, yeah, exactly. that's important. Uh, how about a steam room? Uh, some plants in your landscape can get overshadowed by other plants as they grow and uh, want some more sunlight. So a little bit of pruning, a little bit of pinching, a little bit of deadheading. I really believe that that's got to be a part of uh, a spa day for our outdoor plants. Well, that is happening in a big way in my garden yeah. right now. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of native plants. And so they start out in the summer or in the spring, they look all, you know, small and I start planting new stuff. And next thing I know, I'm like, whoa, that exactly. got huge. Even though I've been growing this thing for, you know, seven years, um, it still always exceeds my expectations on exactly how much it's going to grow and how big it's going to get. So I have a lot of exactly that on my garden list uh, for this weekend. I agree. And with people, of course, I mentioned microderm abrasion, you know, working on wrinkles and acne. Well, uh, how about in our landscape to focus on the weeds and get rid of the weeds? They're competing with our favorite plants. And if you want to give your outdoor plants a spa day, how about we do a little bit of weeding? Oh, all you know, I actually don't mind weeding all that much. There's certain weeds I really detest, but overall it's not my least favorite garden chore. Um, and it's, it's always really interesting and it's always satisfying. Yeah. You know, after you've weeded even a small area of oh, your I garden, you step back and you're like, that looks a lot better. You can tell I spent some time on that. And that's a good feeling. Take me to your weeder. You've got it. So pinch, deadhead, take care of those weeds. It's almost like a manicure, you know? Yeah, that's As a good way people, to think about when it. When we get a manicure, you nailed it. Ah, <laughs> uh, Rick, your remarks grow more polished every day. <laughs> hey, by the way, when we talk about spa, hot tubs, can you use the hot tub water on your plants? Now, provided it's not a salt water hot tub, you know, we tend to change the water in our hot, in, in our hot tubs every three months. So if you took the cover off and let it sit for a couple days, maybe ran the jets and tested for chlorine, bromine, check the pH. Arguably, you could use that water on your plants. Like to, when you, if you drain it? Yeah, when you drain wanna, it oh, for oh, water. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, not scooping it out of the tub while you're in there and watering <laughs> the pansies, but, uh, you know. But anyhow, at the end of the day, as we've learned on this show, we talked about it a few weeks ago, Stacy. You can talk to your plants, you can touch your plants, and they'll enjoy it. And you can just look at them and enjoy their beauty. And don't forget to enjoy the interactions that they're having with each other, with the insects and the birds and all of that. I mean, that to me is where 
the most value and joy comes from gardening. I agree. And not only that, uh, interaction with the atmosphere. Again, check your tomato towers, your stakes, your supports. Make sure that there's good air movement between the plants. We're getting good light to the plants, especially the lower leaves. Those have all got to be considerations, too, for plant spa day. Just no Epsom salts. That's it. That's right. Good. Coming up next, Plants on Trial. Stacy's going to introduce us to a plant. Don't miss it. That's next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, we were just talking about giving your plants a spa day. Mm -hmm. And I think part of giving your plants a spa day, especially if you have hanging baskets, is giving them a little trim because, you know, they can get a little bedraggled at this point in the season. They grow so much. They're so vigorous and they can kind of look a little maybe too long. Yep. They just don't have that cute compact look that you bought them for. So one of my tips, uh, particularly for this time of year, is it's a good idea to trim your hanging baskets, particularly if you have like, you know, super tunias, anything that grows kind of longer. And I always recommend to people that they do this just before they go on vacation. And then that way, you don't have to see it, you know, kind of grow out of that haircut. You cut yeah. it, you drive away, you're gone for a week, you come back, and the thing looks great. Yeah, and you know, along the lines of spa day, we talked about salt scrub. Well, as far as baskets, uh, hanging baskets are concerned, I like to get out a trash can, fill it with water, and dunk the Ooh. whole basket. Oh, that's so a maybe idea. you do your pruning, then you dunk the basket so we get the root ball good and soaked, and we're good to go to go on vacation. Yay. I like it. You know, vacation is also my recommendation uh, for people whose hydrangeas don't bloom mm -hmm. and they're frustrated. I say, just go on vacation, pretend you missed it, come back, everything's fine. Oh, good. <laughs> nice. I Vacation's like it. a solution for so, so many This things. gardening stuff is easy. <laughs> <laughs> just pretend it never happened. But it's a time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say that we tell you all about one of the 320 proven winners, Color Choice Shrubs, and you can decide for yourself if it's going to earn a spot in your garden or landscape. And, you know, I always try to tie it into whatever we're talking about in the first segment. And so today's plant on trial is At Last Rose, a plant that does not really need spa days. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it is a self-cleaning rose. And yes. that's that's a term that goes around a lot, but people don't necessarily, you know, is it like a self-cleaning cat litter box? Like, how does that work? What exactly does this mean? Uh, and no, it doesn't have like built-in windshield wipers or anything like that. Um, the What it means is that the flowers fall off naturally when they fade. Yeah. So the opposite of a self-cleaning rose is one, and I, I'm sure you've seen this and our listeners have, have seen this in gardens, if not in their own garden. So when those rose blooms start to fade, they just kind of like turn into a gross brown Mush. clump. Mush, <laughs> a clump, yeah. A gross brown clump that just sort of stays on the plant and it kind of like nods down yes. and looks super sad and and just clumpy and clumpy. so it's clumpy and it turns brown and it attracts pests like especially Japanese beetles they're yes. gonna love that um, and in a self-cleaning rose like at last rose what happens is that as the blooms start to fade the petals just start to fall off and that means you don't get those like clumpy petals sticking on the plant but also it looks really beautiful because then you have rose petals kind of scattered all over the ground and everybody loves that look. I've seen this in the garden center where you have a number of at last roses on display. And when they do that, it's gorgeous. It's almost like, you know, when the little kid goes down the aisle yeah. in a wedding and, and throws the like rose. Flower it's girl. beautiful. Flower kid. Yeah, yeah, flower kid. Yeah. Every day is a I wedding. I mean, boys and girls do it, right? <laughs> yes. Not just girls. Yeah. Well, yeah. the boy's usually the ring bearer. The little girl's sprinkling the flowers. Okay. And then, so little girl. And they're, they're cutely the walking down the aisle. At Last Rose is a great choice for that. And in fact, speaking of weddings, At Last is one of the reasons uh, that we named this rose At Last because At Last by Etta James is such a popular wedding song. Ah, beautiful. So we thought that this nice. beautiful rose would be the perfect way for people who had that as their wedding song to kind of commemorate that. But it also has another meaning. And that is that it is one of the first fragrant landscape roses. Oh, 
I was going to bring that up. I love the aroma on this rose. It's beautiful. I love to stick my face in it and take a good whiff. It is. It really is beautiful. So it's kind of a an apricot, peachy, orange mm-hmm. color. And it has a classic rose fragrance. So the at last, as in finally, comes from the fact that, you know, we've t- as we've talked about on the show many times, landscape roses are great. They're disease resistant. You don't need to spray them. You don't need to worry about pruning them. They bloom perpetually. But for many, many years, they just didn't have fragrance. And at first, people were like, hey, that's cool. You know what? I don't mind just having this easy to care for rose. It's just going to bloom its head off. But then they started saying, yeah, you know what? I kind of miss the fragrance. So At Last is really one of the first roses to combine that classic rose fragrance, really high petal count, so big, full flowers, but with good disease resistance. And when we say disease resistance on something like At Last, we mean primarily uh, powdery mildew and black spot, the two biggest you know diseases that roses get. So not only is it self-cleaning, it's disease resistant, it's fragrant, it's beautiful. This is a little bit of a taller rose, so probably more in like the three to four foot range. A lot of our oh so easy roses tend to be quite small and ground covering. So it's a shrub rose. You know, you're going to want to plant it like so it has plenty of space right. and and good presence. But it will bloom all summer without deadheading. Now, unfortunately, it is not resistant to Japanese beetles. And I know Japanese beetles are on a lot of people's minds right now. No roses are truly resistant to Japanese beetles. Now, a lot of times landscape roses, like at last, part of their ability to withstand all those common rose diseases comes from the fact that their foliage is thicker and more leathery. And that is a little bit less preferred by Japanese beetles, but I think it's still a stretch to say it's Japanese beetle resistant because if you were to say, have at last, because you said, hey, they eat all my other ones, I'm just going to plan at last, the Japanese beetles are still going to come. I'd fire a shot across the bow and uh, apply uh, your controls, anticipating the Japanese beetles, just as you would with any other. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't want to use any kind of chemical control, one of the great things about Proven Winners Color Choice Roses, since they do bloom perpetually without deadheading, is I know it can be a little bit difficult for some people, but, you know, just go ahead and cut the whole thing back like right about now when the Japanese beetles are at their worst. I know it can be painful, but it's also very painful seeing your rose covered in Japanese beetles and eating your flowers. So just cut the whole thing back, take the flowers off because the flowers are their favorite. That's what they're primarily going for. Cut your whole thing back. I know it's going to be a little painful. Keep watering it, keep fertilizing it for the next, you know, month or so. And it will start to bloom. And when that bloom starts up again, the Japanese beetles will be far diminished and you won't have that issue. So it's kind of like a having your cake and eating it too if you don't want to apply chemical controls. And like many landscape roses, uh, as the temperatures start to cool in September, it really comes into its own again and is just beautiful, covered in flowers, beautiful color, uh, and tons and tons of, of fragrance. As Josephine would say, let them eat cake. It was Josephine, right? Uh, no, that was Marie Antoinette. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Shoot. I was trying to <laughs> tie okay. in roses because Josephine loved roses she so did. much. But you are correct. Hey, Stacy, I was going to send a note to our gardening mailbag, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, as many people do, to ask you a question. And that is, I love my roses in my landscape, but I have a problem. The chipmunks eat the flowers. So this is, you you know, you don't have to write me. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm asking you right now. (laughs) Okay, good. I have never heard of that before. Ah. And this is, it sounds like it's the first time you've seen anything like that. Yeah, and I think it's because it's so hot and dry. I did a little research on the internet and uh, it sounds like other people have that issue too. They just clip them right off. Uh, the, uh, the the flower blossoms, yeah, it's frustrating. Well, you know, and you, when you think about it, rose petals are so succulent. They're just exactly. full of moisture. Um, and most roses, are, actually all rose flowers are edible. Some don't taste as good as others. Um, some are actually quite lovely to, to eat. And so not only is the chipmunk getting this, you know, moisture source at a time where it's incredibly dry here in West Michigan, uh, they're also getting a delicious uh, rose. But, you know, maybe they are on a date and they need to uh, impress their date with some roses. <laughs> I don't know. Every oh, rose has its thorn. Yes. <laughs> yes. And at last does have thorns like most roses. Uh, they're kind of spread out. They're large. They're easy to deal with. And really, it's an easy care rose. Now, of course, the thing to know about roses, always full sun 
you yeah. know, we're not going to recommend that you plan at last rows or any other rows unless you can give it at least six hours of good, bright sun every day. That's going to help that disease resistance. That's going to help you get more flowers, better color on those flowers. So sun is really, I think, the most crucial uh, part of being successful with roses. Even if you pick a very easy to grow, disease resistant landscape rose like at last, Unless you plant it in full sun, you're probably not going to be that happy with the results. I endorse it. Marie Antoinette, I'm sorry I misquoted you. And Stacy, uh, with that last, the color on that rose is gorgeous. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's so many different ways to describe it. Like I said, apricot, peachy. It's just, it's a classic, beautiful color that goes with so many different colors in the garden, so many different house colors. So I think it's a great choice. If you want to see pictures of it, of course, you can always go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and we'll have uh, photos there, all of the information you need to grow it. And you can, of course, find it at your local garden center that sells Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. All right. So, (laughs) hey, by the way, let me get back to Josephine a minute. She would uh, always have roses in her garden because she had bad teeth. And so if she smiled, she'd have a rose at the ready to cover her mouth. Is that true? I think it is. <laughs> I've you never heard us. that before. Write your notes. Send okay. them to us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Well, you, even if you have perfect teeth, you will love that last <laughs> rose. We're going to come back with the guard mailbag in just a moment. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's one of my favorite times of the show because I love helping people with their gardening problems, and I know you do too. Yeah, I like this show. (laughs) I know you like helping people with their garden problems. I hope you like the show. (laughs) If you do have a gardening problem, we'd be happy to help you as well. All you have to do is go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and click the contact tab, or if it's easier, you can go to, you can just send us an email at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com air.com as these people have done. So what's our first question in the mailbag, Rick? Stacy, uh, first one from Kelly in Michigan says something is feasting on my roses. Who is the likely culprit? Where do I look for clues? And Kelly sent us a picture. Right. So since Kelly sent us a picture, and thank you very much for doing that, Kelly, I can confirm it is not chipmunks. It's, we've ruled out <laughs> chipmunks. The the picture, and of course, we'll put this in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. The picture of Kelly's Rose shows some sort of, how would I describe it? Like narrow, um, oval type of holes Mm -hmm. in the leaves. And they're all over the leaves. Mm -hmm. And it is a very easy pest to diagnose for me. It's a very widespread pest. And it is known as a rose slug. And uh, it's not a slug. (laughs) And it doesn't actually look all that much like a slug either. Um, I guess the people probably call them rose slugs because the damage looks a bit, resembles a bit of what slugs would do to something like a hosta or something like that. A slugfest, yes. So it's actually a sawfly. And a sawfly, even though it has fly in the name, we're just going to make things real confusing here. But it's not our fault. We're going to blame the entomologists on this one. Uh, So a sawfly is actually a relative of bees, wasps, and ants, Um, and it's, you know, non-stinging, and basically what happens, the adult is a small flying insect, and they lay their eggs on roses, and the the little larva that hatches out is on the underside of the leaf. So this is another reason why people have so much trouble, you know, identifying a rose slug is the issue is because they're on the underside of the leaf. Sure. All and of a sudden the damage shows up. Yes. And you're like, what happened? And what happens is when that little larva is very tiny, its little mouth can't make it all the way through the leaf tissue. So it only will eat the one layer of the leaf. So at, when the rose slugs are first getting established on your plant, you get this kind of like window-like damage. And you might not even really notice it because it's small because the pests are small. But then as that little larva starts to mature, then it's able to get through the whole leaf. And that's when you start to see those oval uh, kind of, you know, full holes through the leaves. The other tricky thing about rose slugs is uh, like many uh, plant eating insects, they turn the exact color of the plant that they're eating. And it gives them, I mean, it makes sense, right? That whatever they're, they're kind of clearish. So whatever they're internalizing is going to turn them that color, Mm -hmm. but it's also very good camouflage. You are what you eat. If you are a soft insect that a bird would love to find and chow down on, um, it gives them perfect camouflage. So even though I find the damage of rose slug to be very distinctive, a lot of people don't see 
the insects because sure. you do kind of need to train your eye to look for them. Um, so I, you know, a small infestation of rose slug in here in, in Michigan, we only usually have one generation a year. So they kind of get the damage out of their system and move on. Um, I do usually manage them by hand picking. They tend to congregate more at the tops of plants. So again, if you have a disease resistant landscape rose that will bloom, you know, pretty much continually all summer, give it a little trim, throw away all of those, you know, top growth with the rose slugs on them. That's a pretty easy, non-toxic way to manage them, but it's a very widespread pest. Yeah, I do some trimming. Yeah. Because uh, spraying, like you said, one generation, well, then it becomes a revenge spraying. So uh, a little <laughs> bit of trimming and the rose will appreciate it. Exactly. So uh, let me tell you, when you start to uh, look at the damage of rose slugs, it will become second nature to you to, to diagnose this issue as well. So please do go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We'll put some of my favorite resources there that I share with gardeners all the time who deal with this. And uh, then you'll be able to see the rose slug yourself. It's pretty interesting. I don't know. There I like go. it. Very interesting. All right, Janet in Michigan. I want to. I want to wait until fall to plant an area in front of my deck. Of course, fall is a great time to plant. How do I manage the area until then? It's bare dirt, and I would say to Janet, bare dirt is not a natural condition. Something's going to grow there. Now, in the past, when people have faced this issue, Stacy, one thing I've suggested is using some annual rye. We use oh. it underneath shade trees also, just for a temporary cover, and then you can till it in. Yeah, and then it adds organic matter to the right. soil. But yeah, in addition to, you know, who knows what kind of horrible weeds growing in the area, you're also getting soil erosion. Right. You know, whether through rain, irrigation, wind, all of those things will cause your soil to erode a bit. And because organic matter or the good stuff right. in your soil is lighter in weight than your soil particles like clay, sand, and silt, it's the first to go. So when you let your soil, if you were to let your soil erode like that, you'd be losing all the organic matter that is going to be so beneficial when you do plant. So another option would be mulch. Right. Um, and you don't have to go out and invest in fancy mulch, uh, which you're just going to you know, have to move out of the way when you do plant the area. I would recommend that you just get arborist wood chips. And these are not going to be the prettiest, um, but they are going to be highly effective. And you can pile those suckers on a good six to 10 inches is deep, which sounds absurd, except that because this is raw wood that's just been chipped from the tree, it has a lot of airspace in it and it hasn't decomposed a bit like the mulch has. So even after you put a very thick layer like that within a matter of weeks, especially at the height of summer, it's going to start compressing down into a normal size layer of mulch. And then, you know, by the time you're ready to plant, first of all, you're not worried about like, oh, I'm, I'm wasting all this expensive mulch right. that I bought. Um, if it, if it gets into the soil, no problem. If you just move it aside and reuse it, at that point, it will be ready to use as a mulch. So that would be my recommendation. Janet, thank you very much. And All sometimes right. arborist wood chips are even free, oh, yeah. if not extremely low cost. Oh, very, so, very true. Not something you want to walk barefoot on. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> if if this like, is near your deck in a place where you walk, you might want to put some stepping stones or, or something like that. But a good low cost way to manage it. And have fun planting this fall. Eileen sent some photos of her little quick fire hydrangea. The leaves don't have that dark green color. Instead, they almost look green neon. This is their second year, and they receive four hours of direct sun. I thought it could be an iron deficiency, and I applied Espoma Iron Tone, but I don't see much change. Okay, and uh, Eileen, like she said, did send some photos, which we will put on the show notes. And what Eileen is seeing, so basically, if you can kind of imagine this, the foliage has like a, a kind of lighter ring around it. Not quite like variegation, but the edges of the foliage have kind of a yellowish cast. And I have seen this uh, numerous times on hydrangeas, even here in our trial garden where they're, you know, expertly cared for. I don't know exactly what the cause is. I have seen it sometimes over an entire hydrangea. I have seen it sometimes just here and there in a single hydrangea. But I did want to address Eileen's use of iron. So there's nothing wrong with applying that iron necessarily. Um, but if the iron didn't work, when you apply iron to for an iron deficiency, it, the results are usually quite fast, much faster mm -hmm. than applying like a regular fertilizer. Um, but one of the issues with iron is that it can be tied up in the soil with phosphorus. So earlier in the show, we were talking about calcium getting tied up 
if you have too much magnesium, if you've been applying Epsom salts and inducing a calcium deficiency in your plants. So similarly, phosphorus, high phosphorus in the soil can induce an iron deficiency. So it's not that the iron isn't there. It's that it's chemically bound in the soil due to the presence of the phosphorus and it can't be freed up for the plants to take up. Now, one of the issues, of course, is that all commercial fertilizers pretty much are very unnecessarily high in phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the early days in fertilizer where someone said, hey, you know what? I think nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, potassium are the most essential plant the nutrients. Three. The big three. And it's true, they are some of the most limiting. But phosphorus, especially here in North America, not really all that deficient in most soils. And a lot of places, uh, municipalities and so forth, have actually banned high phosphorus fertilizer because the runoff is leading to algae right. blooms. So if you've been fertilizing with a conventional fertilizer that's you know high or even medium in phosphorus, one thing to consider is that it could actually be tying up the iron in your soil, in which case not even the iron that you apply is really going to have much effect. So I would say if you are fertilizing regularly with any kind of fertilizer that contains phosphorus, I would recommend backing off of that or switching to a fertilizer very low or hopefully non-existent in phosphorus. Hopefully we'll get more options that way as yeah. this is more awareness comes to this issue. So back off on the other fertilizer and see if that helps. But don't worry, Eileen, I've seen the pictures of your plant there's nothing to worry about. It's still a healthy, vigorous plant and should bloom just fine this season. Coming up next week, uh, when we have veggie tales, uh, we'll talk about the difference between magnesium and manganese. And uh, Stacy, I think you bring up a good point that people often overlook, and that is checking the soil pH. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's always so, important too. It's a key. All right. Listen, thank you so much for all of your questions. We'd be happy to help you too. Just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and contact us. When we come back, we have got a special guest and he's going to tell us all about gardening in the South. So please stay tuned. It's time for branching news here from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And uh, today, an interview with Dr. Judson LeCompte. Uh, Judson is a product development manager for Proven Winners and one of those people who's traveling North America and the rest of the world looking for great shrubs for gardeners. Judson, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Oh, this is fun. I tell you what, research and development, you know, research and development in plants, maybe this doesn't isn't on a lot of people's radar, but it's, uh, it's an investment. And uh, your work essentially is to be innovative, right? It is. We want to find the best genetics from around the world, bring them back here to Spring Meadow, evaluate them, see how well they do, and then hopefully get them into the catalog. So innovation, Judson, in other words, would it be fair for me to say that you're a risk taker? Very much so. Uh, I think to travel, uh, certainly as a horticulturist, most horticulturists like to stay put. They like to stay with their plants. Um, but I love to travel. Uh, I've got some really scary stories on that for I you. I want to hear some. Uh, <laughs> there was a, almost got blown up in Turkey one time. Whoa! Uh, so yeah, that, that's scary. That was an adventure. Um, <laughs> made it out of that okay. My, my mom was a, she maybe lost a few years <laughs> from that one. Uh, but no, it, we are always hunting for the best new plants. We'll take risks on plant genera's that uh, a lot of companies just wouldn't. You know, we certainly focus on our major categories like hydrangea and wajilla and roses. Uh, but we want to stretch and press the boundaries a little bit and offer people a few newer genetics that they might not be exposed to. So now I detect a bit of a Southern accent. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I know that one of your roles here is specifically trying to expand uh, the Southern plants for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And, you know, because of the podcast and the YouTube show, we have listeners from all over the country, and they were frequently asked to give a little more love to those in hotter climates. And along those lines, I've always wanted to ask you, like, what, now that you've lived in Michigan for three mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. what do you miss most and least about gardening in the South? Oh, man. What do I miss most? 
Is you it can, camellias? Because that's probably I, what I'd say. I, it is. <laughs> it pro- so my PhD was actually in camellias. So I, I studied tea production uh, for Mississippi, actually, oh. when I was in Mississippi. Um, but as an Alabama boy, of course, it's camellias. Um, it's your state flower, right? There, it is our state flower, oddly enough. Uh, not native. But, um, <laughs> but beautiful. <laughs> but beautiful. A lot of camellias came in and out of the Port of Mobile. So that's why uh, camellias are very important to Alabama. Uh, when I miss least, definitely the weed pressure. Weed pressure oh. up here is much lower. Um, I was hoping I wouldn't have uh, nuts edge, but we still have that here. Oh, we got pl- <laughs> nuts um, edge knows no yeah. climate yeah, Jud- boundaries. Oh. Judson, is it true in Alabama that if you're on a country road parked at a stop sign, that the kudzu, if you sit there too long, the kudzu will grow into your through your window? Yes, maybe. It may just come in there, <laughs> reach in and grab you. You know, kudzu is actually not as bad as we once thought it was. Okay. Um, you know, we always say it's the vine that ate the south. Right. I'm not saying it's a good, it was right. a good plant choice. Um, but it does like being in those disturbed areas. So edges of forests, um, roadways, things like that, yeah. um, which is where we see it. Because we're most right. active, so it's there. not going into the forest yeah. and really nat- like valuable natural yes, areas yes, yes, as yes. much as people would assume an, an invasive plant. Would. Yes, but it was brought in to be um, help with erosion control and right. be cattle feed. Um, but it doesn't have a very extensive root system, and cattle don't like to eat it. So, oh, well, that's a problem. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it does grow exceptionally fast, feet a day. So, wow, well, that's uh, that's yeah. impressive. So, um, you know, as you look at bringing more southern or hot climate not just southern because i know you're looking at plants from you know mexico and plants that are appropriate for arid climates as well Mm -hmm. um what do you think are some of the most exciting uh introductions that we've made in the proven winners cooler choice line that people in warmer climates should be aware of so i'm very very excited about the bouvardia that we're coming out with we've got a few different bouvardia still on trial so there's more coming but the first was estralita little star just flowers its head off all summer. As long as it's warm, it's going to be in full flower. And talk about hummingbird magnet. So mm. most people don't know Bouvardia. If they know it, they know it as a cut flower. For me, so. it was a completely new genera as well. So uh, it's a cut flower commonly used in Europe, um, in the Netherlands. The, they grow it, but it gets like six feet tall. In the wild, it's from Texas, mountains of Texas, Mexico, Central America. But it grows in very dry arid deserts. I was just in Chihuahua and you could see it growing on the side of cliffs and hadn't rained in months and just tough as nails. Well, seeing it uh, in the, in the wild is never a problem because no. it's flowers <laughs> scream yes, out yes, 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 from yes. the landscape. And that's one of the reasons that the common name, since people don't necessarily know Bouvardia, the common name we've given it is firecracker bush Yes, because the, the, the flowers do kind of, they've got like a star like quality. They come in a little cluster well, it's nice like a firework, too. When they open, they're going to open a, an orangish red, and then they fade the insides due to a light pink. So you get a little color contrast. So there. I've grown Estrella Little Star, our, our introduction uh, of Bouvardia, as a container plant on my patio. because I perfect. The color is so irresistible. And even though I started with a little tiny quart, it really quickly grew went on to flower like a lot like a mandevilla. You yeah, know, mandevillas yeah. have become really popular as like backyard container plants. Um, I really think there's a lot of potential. And what I loved most most about it is it attracted a ton of hummingbirds. Yes. And the ticket with it is is to just grow it dry. Mm. So again, it's from the desert. So we want to treat it like we would a butterfly bush or a budlia. We want to have super well-drained soil. And a lot of people may think, uh, I lost my budlia over winter because it wasn't cold hardy. Well, it was really that it died from being too wet. Um, So perfect plant. uh, If you're in a cooler region uh, to use as a container plant, stick it in the garage in the winter and bring it back out in spring. And what about your family in Alabama and the South? Would Because they are in a more humid climate, is Bouvardia appropriate for them as well? It it would be. They just really need to watch out. Um, I've told mom and dad they've got one. So like, a, a, don't plant it in the clay. You know, you want to have it in well-drained soil um, just so that you can make it through the winter. So right, that's the biggest clue, yep. the biggest yep. issue for sure. Well, that's fantastic. We're chatting with Dr. Judson LeCompte. He is a product development manager for Proven Winners here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And Judson, uh, a question for you, and that is in 2020, 2021, we saw a lot of new gardeners uh, join into the ranks of those who love what it is we do. And uh, as a product development manager, as someone who goes out and seeks new uh, varieties of plants, you're like a rock star. 
So my question for you would be that uh, the characteristics you're looking for, for me, off the top of my head, I would say the top three characteristics would be deer resistance, uh, fragrance, and heat. Would you agree with that, or am I missing something? No, I think those are very good boxes to check. We have a lot of different things that we look for in plants and um, upcoming trends. One of the big trends that I'm looking at now is that my generation is finally able to purchase a home. Uh, even though interest rates aren't so great. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, so they're finally able to purchase a home. They've had house plants, um, certainly through the pandemic. They needed something to do. They were able to educate themselves. They had time to research about a plant. Um, so they brought them inside, big foliage, bright foliage. I think that's now going to transfer outdoors. Uh, okay. So as we're able to buy houses, we're going to be looking for more foliage color, larger foliage, mm. glossy things. So uh, trying to find that tropical look and extend that to colder regions. I'm definitely hunting for plants to fit that niche. Um, but edibles, also very sure. important. Um, certainly when there's times of financial worry, uh, people turn to edibles very quickly. Um, they just feel some peace of mind having, having something produced from home. Do you, uh, by the way, do you have a favorite season? Oh, let's see. I know it's a tough question, it but is. do you have a favorite season of the year? Well, it is definitely not winter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. That no, that. No, you know, when We're Jensen first moved here and it first snowed, he, I was like, so what do you think? He's like, I love it. It's so no, no, great. No. I, and, and you have, you, I, and I was like, okay, your first snowfall may be a little exciting, but talk to me in March. Okay. So the snow, <laughs> I still love. I still oh, like the snow. Right. Okay. I find pleasure from shoveling my driveway. Oh, okay. There, I, I feel a sense of accomplishment when I'm done. I can see the progress. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, the the like 14 days of sun over winter, not about that. Yeah. Not about that life. But I will say it's the best spring, summer, and fall I've ever had Aww. here in Michigan. That's great. So, so that's, that's all, is it? Worth it, or you're still out, Jerry's still out on that it one. It is worth it because if you're in Alabama right now, I call this summer winter, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so hot, you don't even want to go outside. So you're staying inside. So I actually spend more time outside in Michigan than I ever did in the south. Oh, interesting. Because I think people just think, oh, well, you can be outside all winter, and it's totally great. And Not, yes, you can. It could be 90 at Christmas. Um, wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> no. so. But I'm, I'm still Merry not. Christmas. I'm still not skiing. Everybody here tries to get me to go skiing and no. snowboarding. I'm not trying to get sunny bonoed down the hill. So. No. Uh, I, it's not my thing. Yeah, I, I'm i with you on that. Yeah. But I know you also said that, uh, we're talking about your favorite season, not your least favorite. Oh, but sorry. Yeah. Uh, one thing that really interested me that you said um, over winters here is that the winter is not so brown. Yes, the winter is very green here. So for us in the South, um, all of our, and, and this mostly relies around turf grass, unfortunately, but all of our turf grass goes dormant, and so it turns brown. And because we use cool season grasses here, as soon as the snow goes away, it's bright and green and everything's crisp. Um, and I get to have really great bulbs here. Oh, the so bulbs, yeah. Down south, you know, your tulip will come up even the first year, and it's kind of wonky looking off to the side. And It's true. The here, bulbs are pretty good because, I mean, there's <sighs> very few plants that are as rewarding, right, yes. as a bulb. Yeah. You put them in the ground, they grow for years, they look amazing, you look forward to them. I was never a peony fan, oh. but now mm. I've grown to really appreciate peonies. So, I, Yeah. Uh, what about lilacs? Yeah, okay. You can be honest. It's okay. I, so still not a fan of the lilac. Um, when we go and we evaluate plants every week, um, and we go and look at whatever's looking great that week in our trials. And so, of course, early in spring, we go and look at lilacs. And I always try to travel that week. Don't don't, <laughs> don't tell the bosses. Um, I always try to travel that week because the fragrance is so strong. It actually makes me mm. a little nauseous. Mm. It gives me a headache. It makes me nauseous. But everybody... From the north is so excited to go right. and evaluate him. Mm -hmm. And as one of two southern people here, um, I, it just makes me a little bit nauseous. But now Gardenia Week, all about Gardenia Week. So the gardenias are in full flower right now in oh. the greenhouse. They smell amazing. I agree. They smell amazing. It's, it's just what you're raised with and what, you know, childhood fragrances. Sure. And, you know, I have heard from so many gardeners who have moved to the south or California and they're just like, please tell me I can grow a lilac. And well, you can. The bloomerangs, I mean, do really well um, in the heat. If you're gonna, if you're gonna shoot for a lilac, right, right. Um, not the strong, super fragrance, um, but 
really good repeat bloom and um, got the color got the least. color can yeah. handle the heat and you can always have lilacs as a cut flower if you there live you in go. a hot climate and can't grow them yeah well i'll plan on not bumping into you at the lilac festival <laughs> next uh, year on the east coast you know along that line though judson uh, again as an individual who travels the world and is interested in developing new plant varieties I, when I interview folks in the industry, I always like to put them on the spot and have them give me two plants that are your favorites that you can share with our YouTube viewers, with our listeners. Two favorites, folks, listen up. He's going to share two favorites with us that you should have in your yard. Okay, so off the top, um, I have always loved Katina's Winecraft Black. Mm. Mm. The foliage color has always always been great uh, when when you first start here in, in the company they ask you what your favorite plant is I was like, yeah, that's not, not easy um it just the color is so nice you can prune it hard you can do whatever you want to it you get the nice smoke and um, so for our audience this is a smoke bush oh sorry say, no it's okay you said katinas that's cool uh, like i do the same thing but so smoke bush and people know smoke bush because <laughs> but winecraft black really does it one better with that yes. with that dark dark yes. foliage color um but as a personal hobby uh, my grandmother was a daylily collector and hybridizer uh, and so uh, wow i continue i continue so to love daylilies i moved um from the south with a u-haul full and so but uh, what do you like about daylilies they're tough yes. tough as nails I, I except always, for the deer except, except for the deer um luckily i have a fenced in backyard so that's good um but uh, you can grow them in concrete you can grow them from coast to coast north to south um, and I can breed those. So if mm. I breed a shrub, sure. you know, I right. feel, I feel Years, responsibly yeah. that I should give it to spring meadow. Uh, okay. Gotcha. But, you know, a, a daylily, I could take that. Uh, I still go into proven winters. Right. So what, um, like what style of daylilies do you like? Um, I tend to like, uh, diploids. So, so just what's because that, what's that mean for, um, so this is going to be generally smaller flowered, mm -hmm. um, but more flowers. Um, and then your tetraploids will have larger flowers, larger foliage, but generally less flowers. No, okay. So they're the bigger showier ones. Right. Um, so I can't grow daylilies because of the deer mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's fine. Cause I, they're definitely not my favorite plant, but if I did, uh, if I, if they I could grow overused. one, if I could grow one, I would grow autumn minaret. Cause I love like those really tall, yes. really open flowers. And I hear those aren't really like fashionable. They're anymore. not fashionable. Um, right now my two favorite going bananas. Oh, that's first to bloom every spring. It's a simple yellow. But it flowers mm -hmm. its head off. And then tiger swirl. Oh, yeah. Honkin' big flower. Really, really big. Honkin' big flower. Honkin' big. There's some Alabama for you. <laughs> uh, really, really big flower. And it, it flowers on a, on a large scape as well. Oh, so, that's nice. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, years ago, I was talking to someone from Proven Winners Perennials, and they said that going bananas daylily got its name from the breeder's wife. Because, uh, you know, she was like walking into the house and she said, oh, man, that new yellow daylily you're working on is going bananas out there. <laughs> and that was how it got its name. It doesn't surprise me that you like the taller daylilies uh, because Judson, she uses words like clumpy. Oh. Doesn't like clump, <laughs> like like garden mums, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm not the big. I like I like plants with space. In Open them. in there. Yeah. <sighs> I can I can tend to like the meatballs. <laughs> so, there's something for everybody, I know, right? I know. Yeah, she's got the the naturalistic look, and I want mine. It's good. Nice and, it's all good. Yeah. There's, <laughs> I, you know what? That's the great thing about gardening is yes. there's something for everybody, and everybody's taste and preferences can be accommodated. And if your taste and preferences change, you can always just change yeah. your garden. Yes. It's like so dynamic. You're never yes. Plant aside from trees, you're really not very locked in. And even then. Well, even then. <laughs> so I, um, I have a very good friend in Tennessee, Miss Eleanor Fry. She was 103 years old. She was a conifer collector. Um, she was an amazing person. And one of her favorite sayings was, if she dies, she dies. And that was her motto with gardening. Mm. You get it. You plant it. If it dies, it dies. Do your research. Do Make a knowledgeable choice and try to put the plant in the right place. Yeah. But you got to realize we're working with a living thing, and sometimes uh, it just doesn't work out. I agree 100%. I've always said if you haven't killed any plants, you're not trying hard. Yeah, you're not a real horticulturist. You know right. how many plants we kill? Oh, oh my gosh. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. We're all like looking at each other suspiciously. Like it's, a, it's our personal, <laughs> our, our personal plants better be tough. Exactly. <laughs> but aside from clumpy plants and uh, what'd you call them, Judson? Hon- uh, hon- meatballs. Meatballs. Uh, meatballs. Honkers? Honkin' meatballs. Honkins. Yeah. Honkins. Uh, question for That's you. It's a and- good name for a plant. <laughs> Help me out here. And by by the way, we're we're chatting with Dr. Judson LeCompte, and he is a product development manager here for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Judson, uh, just a quick comment on using native plants in the landscape because you know there's so many great new varieties now. How do you feel about native? Plants? I love native plants. Actually, during my uh, master's research, I worked with the Forest Service, um, working with. Uh, Saracenia or pitcher plant, mm, um, cool. Saracenia rubra waria or wary's pitcher plant, um, to propagate those from a bog that they couldn't incorporate fire into. So fire is very important in southern uh, forests, and so we actually propagated that and got it into a bog that they could manage. And so that population is now flowering and reproducing. Oh, cool. um, so very passionate about native plants. The only problem with native plants is that they've not been developed for long, mm. um, or if they have been. It's been in Europe. Mm. So we'll travel to Europe often to find our natives that have had breeding work done to them to have better habit, better size, more uniform that we would look for in a horticultural plant. Um, You look at roses or hydrangeas. They've had hundreds and hundreds of years of breeding and improvement um, where a lot of our natives haven't. So it gives us a great opportunity uh, to find some really awesome natives and that we see every day and just underappreciate. Sure. We know the demand is continuing to grow for native plants. Uh, But I don't want us to get one-sided either. It's about having a diverse landscape. Um, You know, if we we were to only eat um, the plants from Northern Africa, uh, where people originated from, uh, we would be very limited Mm. in our diet. Um, So insects and pollinators and birds, they eat a lot of different things, not just native things. Um, don't send me hate mail. Um, but uh, it's about having a diverse landscape full of natives as well. Do you have a favorite place to travel to in your work? If you were to pick one, say, yeah, this is on the agenda. I am I love going here. Asia is very fun. Okay. I like Asia a lot. Um, the food is good. The people are good. Um, for me, it is the plants are very important. Mm-hmm. Um But I'm like a talent agent. The people are so important for me. I want want our breeders to be successful. Um, I want to promote them as much as possible. Um, And so you make friends everywhere you go. So there's not a bad place um, when you're dealing with plant people. That's true. I agree. Well, it's been a pleasure to get to know you, Judson, and uh, having you join us here on the Gardening Simplified show. Uh, I call it a kick in the plants, but it's always fun to... Meet people like you. You're just so enthusiastic about plants, and we learn from you. And and thanks for all the work you do. Well, thank you. It was great to be here. Well, I think Judson said it best. Plant people are the best people. That means you. That means Adriana. That means all of you, too. So thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next week.